Well, hello everyone and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement 2. On today's video, we're gonna be taking a look at some motherboards. I've never tested these. There's two XT motherboards, two 3D6 DX motherboards. Let's see if these work and maybe they will, maybe they won't. Maybe there'll be a little bit of a repair. So the first motherboard we have to look at is an IBM PC motherboard, the original 5150. Now taking a look at this one, it's a later one here. It says right here, 64K to 256K. The original ones had 16K through 64K. The motherboard otherwise is very much like an IBM PC XT motherboard, other than it has five slots instead of eight, like the later XT. This one's in pretty good shape. Uh, all of these motherboards, all four we're gonna look at today, were very, very dirty when they were given to me. So I gave them a good scrub with soap and water under the sink in the upstairs in the kitchen. I actually filled the sink with water, and soapy warm water, and I submerged the motherboards, then really scrubbed them, clean them up, and let them dry. And um, well, now they look awesome. Looking at the day codes on this motherboard, we're looking like mid to late 1983, probably more towards the later end. I see stuff like 34th week and things like that soldered onto the board. So considering the original PC came out in what well, was it 1981 or 1982 that it came out? I'm gonna have to look that up because I don't remember. All right, yes, it was 1981 that it came out. So this was kind of late in the game considering the XT was just around the corner. Does it have an article here for the XT? There it is, the XT came out in March of 1983. But I guess I didn't realize that the XT and the original PC were sold concurrently both until April 1987. In fact, it looks like everything was pretty much sold until that date, including the PC AT as well. I guess that's when IBM released the PS2 line of machines and they just kind of discontinued the entire product range. I would have thought that the XT would completely replace the original PC just because, well, you know, it had extra slots and otherwise was generally the same performance of these two machines. It's pretty much identical. For testing out all these motherboards, I'm gonna use these two cards. We have a VGA card 8-bit one, so it works on both the XTs and the later 3D6s. And then we have my XT IDE card here, and that works on pretty much anything. And I'll just stick in this compact flash card here I was using it on my Pentium system. So that makes that ready to go. So let's test that first PC5150 motherboard. All right, so for testing, I'm just gonna use this ATX power supply here and I have an adapter connected to it that goes from ATX to AT and has a power switch right there. And what I like to do is I put a mouse pad on top, even though I have these little pads right here, I put the mouse pad there. And with the power supply connected, the first thing I need to do with this PC5150 motherboard is just quickly check across the tantalum caps for any shorts, because it's super common that these things have shorts in some of the tantalums. With the power supply connected, one thing I can do is just go between the five volt or the red wire and the black wire. And we're getting 14 ohms, which is fine. That's not a short. Zero or like one ohm would be a short. And on the 12 volt rail, 89 ohms. So that's fine. I'm just gonna flip the motherboard over here and I'm just gonna check across these caps right here. So that's fine. That's 14 ohms. That's the same five volt rail we were looking at before. And everything appears to be just fine. I don't see any shorts. So we're gonna go off the, off the assumption that there is no short. One thing I'm noticing and I'm a bit concerned about is this missing IC right here. What, what is that supposed to be? I wonder if someone pillaged something off of here or maybe that chip isn't normally there. And it definitely looks like something was pillaged here. Let's zoom in. This is minus zero degrees dot net. And the IC that's missing is right here, 8284A. Stolen, stolen off the motherboard, how rude. And then this is a 8288, which is on the motherboard because that's soldered. Let's see if I can find one of these. 8284. I'm thinking that there's probably one on this motherboard that I can steal and everything is in sockets. So that's super handy. Yep, and there it is, it's this IC right here. It's the clock generator IC. So the PC Sprint Accelerator would plug into that particular socket on the motherboard, and then you'd have the clock synthesizer chips there. I'm wondering if um, maybe this had an accelerator and someone you know, pulled that stuff out when they took this motherboard out of the original case, and they left that chip on the little plug-in board. So we will just borrow this one out of here for testing purposes at least. 
All right, so the IC is installed. I have a postcard in here. Postcards, postcodes don't work on XTs, but I'll at least be able to see the voltage rails, XT IDE, and we have the VGA card. There are some dip switches you have to set. So if you just Google for those settings, you'll be able to find out how to set those. I have a VGA card in here, so I need to set it for like EGA. Otherwise, the motherboard BIOS is going to try to activate a CGA card or a monochrome card. Okay, switches are configured, power supply is connected. I hooked the speaker up on the postcard to the motherboard. Let's see what happens. This might shoot sparks. I'm gonna roll back a little bit here. No, okay, it's on. Now, is it working or posting or anything? I haven't heard any beeps or whatnot. Well, that's not a good sign. Now, I don't think this thing is even trying to post. There's a missing ready light right here on the motherboard that should come on, I'm pretty sure if the system were working properly. It goes in and out of reset normally, but that light is not coming on. So I don't think this thing is actually doing anything. I'm gonna pop the CPU out of here and I'm gonna install the one off this clone motherboard here. I wouldn't say it's out of the realm of possibility that this motherboard was retired because there's some kind of a fault with it. So um, that might require a, a more in-depth troubleshooting video coming up. Let's see if that does anything different, nope. No ready signal either. Well, now it's just making a full on buzzing noise. So I'm just feeling around to see if, see if anything is a, uh, hot, but nothing feels unusually warm here. Alrighty, well this motherboard is gonna need future repair. I think that's beyond the scope of this video, but repairing a 5150 motherboard could be fun and interesting. So we're gonna do that in the future. For now, I'm just gonna pop this clock chip back off of here so we can put this back onto the XT motherboard because I do wanna test that. Okay, so this motherboard's not working, so this is gonna go on the future repair pile. So the next motherboard we have is just a regular IBM PC XT clone motherboard. So it's got all eight slots. This has capability of 640K of memory. Now this particular motherboard layout is very, very similar to one I worked on previously on the channel. I think I had one of these where one of these ICs was bad right here. And anytime you tried to access the floppy drives, which uses DMA, the system would crash. It is interesting that all of the ICs on this motherboard are in sockets, which means that that particular troubleshooting session would have been a little bit easier because everything on that board, which was basically identical to this one, uh, was soldered. So I had to de desolder a bunch of things. I thought maybe it was some of the chipset chips that were going bad, but in the end, it was one of these ICs here. Now this machine, as you can see, only has 256K of RAM installed on it. There's really no way to know if this machine ever had more memory on it or someone pillaged the RAM to use it somewhere else but ultimately you would have two banks of 256K to give you 512K, and then these two banks you would fill up with 64K DRAM to give you that extra 128K to bring you up to 640 total. Just giving a push on these ICs, they are kind of coming out of the sockets a little bit. I did wash this one just like I washed the other XT motherboard, um, but it looks like it's in okay shape. And as you notice here, the ROMs have tape over the window. So clone ROMs, I doubt this has a copy of IBM's ROM. This is probably some kind of like Phoenix BIOS or something like that, but we'll find out when we turn it on. Here's the main processor. It's just an 8088 and it doesn't look like uh, it's a Dash 2. So I don't think this is a turbo motherboard. Usually when you have one of these motherboards that's a turbo variant, if you look up here along the top edge, there's gonna be some extra components because this right here is the clock chip, essentially for the 8088 series of processors. And this is the main crystal here at 14 megahertz. So this gets divided down to 4.77 megahertz. And because we're not seeing anything extra up here, you zoom out a little bit there. I don't think this is a turbo motherboard. This is just a bog standard XT clone. One interesting thing about this one, which I haven't noticed before on any other motherboard is it has this extra connector here, which is a little unusual. This is gonna be, I think the standard PC XT type connector. And it is the same number of pins. It's on the other motherboard, so I don't know what the deal is with this extra connector here. Maybe some of these were installed into machines that had a different power supply 
connector or something. I, I don't really know. The only other thing that's a little bit interesting about this motherboard, and if we zoom up right here, it looks like someone has attempted to solder on to the speaker connector. Instead of using a slide on connector, there are little blobs of solder on there. Let's put back on the clock synthesizer chip. We'll need to reinstall the CPU as well, which I don't remember which socket this goes in. I'm gonna say it's, I'm gonna say it's this one here. Now this motherboard has a lot of socketed chips, as I mentioned. So I'm gonna give each one of them a little push just to make sure that they are actually in the motherboard since I did wash this and you know put it through a bunch of trauma, so to speak, under the sink. Some of these are pretty loose in the sockets. like They're moving in quite a bit. All right, I cleaned the extra solder off these pins here. So we hooked the speaker up. I'm just gonna try powering this up first without any video cards or whatever, because I need to set the jumpers and there's one jumper block. I think that's, I'm sure this is a clone of the XT, so probably use exactly the same jumper config as that. Okay, let's see. Okay, so, um, oh, you're not seeing what I'm seeing. Switching over here to this. So we are getting the ready light, which we were not getting on the other one. And we turn this back off and on again. Goes from reset to ready. So that looks like it's working properly. Let's plug in these cards and I'm gonna have to set those jumpers up. We'll see if this thing boots. Looking at the switch settings here, it looks like this had 640K at some point because it was configured for all four banks of RAM. So I'm just switching it now to be only bank zero. And it looks like it had CGA originally because it's how it was configured. So I'm gonna set it up for EGA and I'm gonna set this for one floppy drive. It looks like it was configured for two floppy drives and I don't have any floppy drives. So hopefully it's okay with that. All right, I have the VGA connected to the capture device, and that's what you see the test pattern on there. Let's turn this on. Do we get any image? No. No image either. So this thing may be bad as well. Switch that input. All looks good here, but we don't have any postcodes, so that's um, not helpful. All right, here's something interesting. There's a jumper right here. It may not be easy to see, but it's J1. And it says J1 on for 64K and off for 256K. Well, these chips here are 2764s, so they're 8K each. And um, that jumper maybe was pillaged. So let's reinstall it. I was a little wary of systems like this that have had things clearly stolen from them. So I'm gonna turn this on. Oh, take a look at that. The switch inputs. Oh, uh, we still don't have working video, but we have sound. And I do have a postcode of FF, so it shows it's trying to do something, but we got a working beep out of it. But why do we have no video? Maybe I have this plugged into the wrong thing. No, it is definitely plugged into the right thing. I just knocked my jumpers over here. I'm just making sure that I'm on the right input on the scan converter. And we are, it just says no sync. So it's not seeing a signal. I wonder if my, I wonder if my VGA card is bad here. That is quite possible. Let's pop this out of the motherboard and see what happens when we turn it on without it. So it just beeps right away. Does the same thing. I'm gonna stick a CGA card in here, which I happen to have right here. Let's pop this in. See if this makes a difference of any kind. Power this on. So we're not getting a beep now. Let me get out the RGB to HDMI so we can get this thing hooked up to something so we can see what's happening. And I need a battery pack. All right, we have the RGB to HDMI hooked up. Uh, let's turn this on. Whoa, I saw something. Is this working or is it not? What's happening here? I know this card works. I've tested this card before. Well, I just realized I have to set the switches to CGA, which I just did. Oh, look at that. Uh, it gets rid of the menu here. Go away. Uh, ignore the little bit of jittery. Ram testing, 129. Okay, well, um, wait, system? <laughs> it says system already. <laughs> system already? Or system ready, is that what it's trying to say? 128. Okay, what happened to the rest of the memory? Let's turn this off and on again. There's no reset switch or anything on here. Okay, it, it must be freezing up on the RAM test. So there must be bad memory. This uh, RAM that's on here must be bad. Let me do a quick swap 
of the RAM and see if we can get this thing working. This BIOS looks interesting. I've never seen a BIOS that looks like this. Uh, sorry, ignore the jittering on the text. That is completely from the uh, capture device. It's just not set up for this particular VGA or CGA card. Okay, so I'm gonna swap in new memory because it appears there's a problem here. Okay, so as you can see, it's still stuck on 129K, but I did find a bad RAM chip. Uh, it was this one. Uh, yeah, it was this one right here. When this is in the board, it actually stops around like 66K and it has a little R next to it. So I think what's going on here, well, I don't know what's going on here, but I found out one thing. If we go here and I change switch one from floppy drives enabled to no floppy drives enabled, turn on the system, we get this IBM compatible BIOS. And I think it's gonna try to boot, insert diskette. And if I hit a key on the keybar, which I did plug in, it drops into basic. Well. It did drop into basic. Oh, there it is. Cassette basic uh, by Sun Up Computer. So a total copy of IBM's BIOS here. A total, utter copy. Completely rude, but it does seem to work. Let's uh, type a little program out here. 10 print hello viewers. 20 go to 10 run. There it goes. So yeah, it's kind of slow, 4.77 megahertz, but it does work. So the thing is, I hit control, alt, delete, it's rebooting. There it is. What I don't know what's going on is why isn't it booting off my XT IDE? It's not even showing it on, it's not even showing the ROM. It's, I'm gonna plug this into a different slot, see if that makes any difference at all. Nope, no difference. Interesting, I don't know what's up with that. I've had really good luck with this card and all sorts of things, but for whatever reason is not happy in this machine. I have a floppy drive hooked up to this thing and uh, the computer is not booting. It does seem to seek the drive, but I don't know if it's my controller or the motherboard or the floppy drive at this point. This is one of those situations where it could be any of them that's not working. So I don't know if the problem is the motherboard here or something else. I'm gonna try turning it on without a disc in there and I want to get to the insert boot disk prompt, and then I'll put this disk in there. Okay, there we go. Put the disk in, push a key, the light's on. It's not seeking, the head is not moving. In fact, the disk drive just stopped spinning there. So my assumption at this point is, I'm just power cycling it again. My assumption is there is something wrong with this motherboard, and it, it could be like that other one I had where the floppy drive interface, anytime you try to use it, it would actually crash. It, now that one, when it crashed, it did a little bit more crashing than this, which just sort of freezes. But yeah, I've tried two different drives, two different boot disks. I don't have two different disk controller cards because I just have this one, but I know this controller works. This is just a standard PC floppy drive controller. And yeah, this thing doesn't seem to be happy. So unfortunately, I don't have more time to do more troubleshooting with this particular XT motherboard. You could end up chasing your tail endlessly with problems like this. This could be a problem with the BIOS, like maybe this BIOS is not very compatible. This could be a problem with, you know, one of these chips on here that's causing an issue. It could well be, uh, where is it, that my floppy drive controller is decided to not work. But I am gonna wager that there is something wrong with this motherboard and maybe that's why it was taken out of service. Probably the first thing to do when I go to do further troubleshooting on this is to replace the BIOS with one of those diagnostic BIOSes, the one that's for the IBM PC XT. Those just boot straight into a Diag screen and then test all sorts of the peripherals on the machine. And that might actually tell us more than this junk BIOS that doesn't seem to tell us anything. So if you have any ideas of what might be wrong with this, definitely let me know in the comment section below. But yeah, thinking that something is very wrong with this. Alrighty, onto the next motherboard. Take a look at this beauty. This, as you can see, is a full-size 3D6DX motherboard. It has the Mathco processor. It has a beautiful color solder mask here with these gold traces underneath. It's just copper, but the way it shines through is gold. And if we flip this over, the bottom of the board just looks amazing as well. You can see that it's a multi-layer board. You can tell that by these darker sections here where these are traces that are underneath the uh, fiberglass layers. 
So this is the top layer here, well, our bottom layer, because we're looking at the bottom of the board. But yeah, there are traces that run underneath. So when you have damage with these types of motherboards, it can be a little difficult for troubleshooting because of these traces that are hidden away. Luckily on this one, you can actually see them, at least from the bottom side here. And if we flip it over to this side, well, there's another layer of traces under there as well. So this is gonna be a four layer PCB, which just makes it that much harder to troubleshoot. Looking at the beautiful purple package here on the Intel 386, we have a 33 megahertz part for the main CPU. And the Mathco processor is a 25 megahertz part. So either it's overclocking the Mathco processor or this particular chipset may run the Mathco processor at a half clock speed. Maybe there's a jumper setting for that. Who knows? The main chips on this board is chips and technology. And if we zoom out here a little bit, you can see that there are a lot of these VLSI chips here that make up the chipset. The 3D6 architecture was a lot more complicated than the one from the 286. And since this board probably came out before IBM even rela released a 3D6, these third-party chipsets needed to be used. They couldn't have just copied something that IBM did like everyone did for the 286 and the original XT and the PC. The BIOS on this is an AMI BIOS and it looks like if we can get it to focus there that it's got a 1986 date on it. That doesn't mean that this motherboard is from 1986 though, because looking at these soldered ICs right here, they have 1989 day codes. I'm not totally familiar with who released when, when it comes to the 386 processor. IBM probably already had a 386 released already, but it was probably micro-channel in the PS2 line of machines. And as you can see, this thing is completely ISA bus, so it doesn't support anything faster than the 16-bit. There is this extended slot right here, which almost certainly is gonna be for some proprietary RAM expansion card that was designed for this motherboard specifically to allow you to go beyond the onboard memory, which you can see there's a lot of onboard memory on here. Now looking at the RAM chips on here, they appear to be one megabyte by one IC. So you need eight of them to equal one megabyte. And if we zoom out here, well, we can see there's a ton of memory on here. So looking at the RAM that's on this board, we have one, two, three, four, five, and six megabytes of memory. And then it looks like we have seven, eight, and then nine, because there's actually an extra RAM chip right here. Nine megs of RAM is a little unusual. It's quite possible this thing is using parity RAM chips. And in that case, there's only eight megabytes on here. And that means there's nine chips to equal one megabyte because the extra IC is used as parity. In that case, we can count up the memory as one, two, three, four, five, six megabytes of RAM, seven, eight, and then these eight chips right here are all parity memory chips. So eight megabytes. That makes a lot more sense. I would not expect this thing to have nine megs of RAM on it. Now, if you've wondered what that extra parity chip is all about, I'm just gonna give a very simple high level explanation. But what happens is as data is stored into the main memory, the system does a little bit of a calculation which creates extra bits of like a checksum in a way it can store in that extra RAM chip. So when the data is right back, if there's a problem with one of the RAM chips, say it has a fault or whatever, then that checksum will no longer match based on that extra ninth chip and the system will halt and say parity error. Because 3 to 6 motherboards like this would have been really expensive. They were designed for high-end systems. Therefore, that extra parity RAM, even though you're spending, well, money on a whole extra megabyte of memory for this 8 megs of RAM, it's worth it for a system stability standpoint to make sure that you're not going to have weird things happening with your system based on RAM errors. You'd rather have the system halt than do unpredictable things running code. When it comes to brand names of this 360X motherboard, the only thing I could find is this sticker here that says SYS. Over here between these slots, it says version 5.2. There are some silkscreen markings around the jumpers in this location. And it looks like over here, there might have been some kind of sticker at some point, because I see there's some residue there. Perhaps that was more information about the model number of this motherboard. And lastly, this thing did have a clock battery. And there it is, and it looks like it did leak a little bit but the damage looks like it's incredibly minor. So hopefully that shouldn't be a problem at all. Alrighty, here we go with this 386 board. We are not having a good luck today. Everything seems to be not working. So in with the postcard here, and let's see, I'm just gonna try powering this up with nothing else connected. So just the power cable and the postcard. See what happens. Good, we're actually getting postcodes. That indicates that this thing is actually trying to work. 
So excellent. All right, so I have it hooked up to VGA. I cannot believe this is not working. I wonder if my VGA card is bad. Oh, wait, wait, no, it's working. Here we go. There it is, excellent. Let's plug in the keyboard here. So it's counting up the RAM. It's cut off a little bit. Maybe I can fix that here, let's see. Unfortunately, this particular VGA card, the timing's a little, a little different than uh, what the capture device is used to. All right, well, it's nice that at least one motherboard is working. Let's see if I plug the keyboard in, if this actually works. Now, it, notice how it's counting up very slowly. It's quite possible that it needs a turbo jumper. So I got my jumpers here. All right, well, I put the jumper on, but just as it finished counting the memory, there was a jumper on the turbo switch area and the, the pins were bent. Is the keyboard working? It is indeed. Okay, check some failure. Of course, that's normal. There's no battery. All right, so we have standard and extended setup. Unfortunately, okay, there we go. Uh, pretty run of the mill stuff here. We'll just switch this to VGA, blah, blah, blah. Save, yes. Does that appear to be counting any faster? I'm gonna move the jumper to the other setting. So I take the jumper off. Looks the same to me. Oh, that's going faster. Okay, so it was on turbo. It's a slow memory count, that's for sure. Let's go into the extended setup, see what kind of options are there. Failure, yeah, okay, so it's not happy that there is no battery. All right, easy, chips and technology. Chipset register setup, advanced. You can add or disable and remove the shadow memory. Well, let's just go right to advanced. Yep, warning message. All right, so this is not easy, but I guess if you read the documentation for the chipset, so the 82C, 302, 301, and 206, you can tweak the actual registers in the chipset to do all sorts of things. Clock and weight state control. Let's exit out of this and go back to the easy mode. All right, so there it is. Uh, DRAM type bank zero and one. So obviously the eight megs that are on board the motherboard are bank zero and one because it needs 32 bits of memory for each of the banks. Anyways, it looks like you can do zero or one weight state. Uh, the memory that's on here, let's see how fast it is. Oops, knocking things over. It's 80 nanoseconds. And to be honest, I don't remember if 80 nanoseconds is fast enough for zero weight states on, uh, this is going to be a 33 megahertz processor, I think. So processor clock can be either the processor oscillator itself, which let's look for it on this board. Well, there are two crystals on here, a 40 and a 50 megahertz cross crystal oscillator. So I have a feeling that this is actually running at 25 megahertz right now because the 50 megahertz is probably the, the processor oscillator and that gets divided by two. But it looks like you can also run it off the system clock times two. We'll have to play around with that and see how fast that is exactly. But it's kind of neat. You have the ability to set up some of the clocks. So like the eight megahertz ISA bus can either be processor clock divided by three. So what, 50 megahertz divided by three or AT clock, which will probably be eight megahertz, things like that. The DMA clock is controllable as well. There are S clock and S clock dash two. And I guess S clock is probably the syst clock, whatever that is, I'm not sure how fast that is. Looks like you can shadow the memory, which does really improve performance. I use page up, page down to change that option. So yeah, kind of cool. Some nice options here. Enable, disable. Why don't we enable all these? And let's write the registers and reboot. Let's see if the XT IDE card is actually working or is there something wrong with it? I think there's something wrong with it because it should have shown up as well. Why is everything breaking? I don't understand. I used this thing recently and the, the ROM's not even showing up. Oh, look at that. I just took it out and put it back in the slot now it's recognized. Let's see how fast this computer actually is right now. I predict 25 megahertz. Ah, oh, got to reboot with the uh, holding down shift. What I like about Speed 600 Landmark Speed Test is you can change the jumper for like the clock speed and see it in real time. And you should be able to like see what it's running at. Okay, 25 megahertz, exactly like I thought. If we take this jumper off here, move it to the other position. 
There we go, it slowed down. And if we retest with F9, it should tell us what the new CPU speed is, 20 megahertz versus 25. So we do have the FPU running there, but now I wanna go back in the BIOS and change that option for the processor clock. Let's see how fast we can make this thing run. Okay, I'm gonna change this to sysclock times two. See how fast uh, this runs now. Also, do you notice that after I went into the extended setup, there was no more CMOS checksum error? So I think what's happening is just going to the main CMOS setup, saving it, even though there's no clock battery, was causing an error. And you had to go into both the extended and the normal one and set it up first, so you wouldn't get that error anymore. Of course, just power cycling this machine is gonna cause it. Oh, look at that, processor clock is B clock. What's the B clock, I wonder? Anyhow, as I was saying, just powering the machine off, of course, it's gonna cause those settings to get lost again because there's no battery on this machine. But so far, this computer is working nicely, which is a nice change compared to those other two motherboards. Oh, it's running at nine megahertz now. <laughs> okay, does the turbo switch even work anymore? I don't think the turbo switch is even gonna do anything and it does not do anything. So S clock times two is slow. S clock must be 4.77 megahertz, I'm assuming, right? Is that what we're seeing there, 9.78? I don't know, anyways. Let's run, check it. You can ignore those weird little marks. That's because the font changed from speed 600 and check it doesn't reset it. So let's just see if everything is looking okay. Uh, I don't know, test uh, system board? I don't really know. The computer's working. It's booting the DOS 622. Seems like everything is fine. This should pass the tests. I'm gonna say this board works which is cool, and there we go. Everything passes. So I'm gonna say this board is working perfectly for time purposes. Let's move on to the last board, see if that one works. Alrighty, and on to the last motherboard we're gonna be looking at today. It's another 386DX motherboard, and this one has a beautiful shiny yellow coating to it. Look, it does not have the math coprocessor installed. We just have a 33 megahertz part. There's a 66 megahertz crystal oscillator here, which indicates this is definitely an actual 33 megahertz motherboard spec to run that fast. The BIOS on here says 1989 AMI 386BIOS Plus. The date codes on the soldered ICs on this are also from around 1989. And you'll notice that this has a chips and technology chipset as well, but unlike the other motherboard, it only has one single IC. So that's a bit different. It does have some PALs on here though, programmable array logic. And with PAL chips like this I see here and there as well, they're able to combine a bunch of TTL logic down into these ICs. It's probably something the other motherboard is doing in its chipset, but it is still surprising that this entire chipset is this one chip versus a whole bunch of large VLSI chips like on the other motherboard. And you know what, upon closer inspection, all of these are PAL chips as well as are these. So I think a lot of the chipset is just in these PAL chips as opposed to being in dedicated larger ICs. So that would give us an idea that maybe this particular motherboard is earlier or the chipset is earlier because they're, they hadn't integrated all these PAL chips yet into VLSI chips. But it does appear to have a couple SRAM chips right here, which I'm thinking might be cache memory. So 55417-20s, I don't know what size those are, but I'm pretty sure that these are going to be SRAM chips. Now moving over to this side of the motherboard, we have more memory chips here, and I think these are the same part number actually, 55417 as well, but these are dash 35s. I think these are also SRAM chips, which is really unusual actually, considering this thing has all of these SIM sockets right here, which let's see if any of them were broken. Looks like one is broken. This one right here, the clip is broken slightly on it. They are plastic. That's a bit of a bummer, but luckily this side is okay, which means that memory will probably work fine in here. There's also a custom proprietary slot right here, which will be for RAM expansion as well. Those boards are pretty much not interchangeable from one motherboard to another. Obviously, as you saw, the other one we looked at just before had a larger connector over here. Well, this one does it down here. 386DX is a full 32-bit processor like the 386SX, but it also has an external 32-bit data bus which means it's significantly faster than 386SX, which did come out later, incidentally. And it's going to be bottlenecked by the fact that it has these 16-bit ISA slots. But the memory access should be pretty quick, especially with this cache memory, or maybe this cache memory right here. And because this motherboard uses 30-pin memory modules, which happen to be 8 bits wide, since the processor is a 32-bit processor, you need to install four at a time because the processor can only address, will always needs to address 
32-bit memory. Well, it could be made to actually do it at 16-bit, like the BIOS right here. That's why there's only two 8-bit chips here, but that's significantly slower, so all these motherboards are going to need four at a time. And that's just like the 46 processor as well. All right, so let's look for markings on here. So we have a serial number here, and it starts with a 90 and then a 13. So I've got to think that this is from the 13th week of 1990, even though some of the ICs on here are from the end of 1989. Maybe this motherboard sat around a little while before it was actually sold. On this side of the motherboard here, it says Copper 8 1989, Rev C, made in Taiwan. There's an OK sticker, and that is actually that. And on the back of the motherboard, it looks freaking amazing. You can see here these dark color traces. So this is also a multi-layer board. Almost certainly it's going to be four-layer board as well. So we have the traces that are exposed here. Then we have these, which are on the next layer down. And if we flip this over, you can't see those traces. You can see a different set of dark traces along with the gold color traces. So yeah, four layers, once again, makes troubleshooting more difficult. But on this particular motherboard, it doesn't appear that it ever had any battery leakage because I don't immediately see uh, an onboard battery. There is a header right here, a four pin header, and the location of it pretty much screams that there was an external battery used with this motherboard. Okay, the last motherboard postcard is in there. Let's try to get this silly harness thing connected to it. Alrighty, it is all connected. I'm gonna switch to a different view here. Wow, that's kind of blurry. Maybe if I move out of the way, let's turn this on. Hey, that is a good sign. It is actually posting. Uh, there's no RAM, so it's not really going to do anything, I don't think. I think if we hook up the speaker here, we're going to hear some beeping. Beep, beep, beep. It's unhappy because I think there's no RAM. So let's put some RAM into it. Now, I don't know which is bank zero and bank one. I'm going to assume this one is bank zero over here, which is the right way to put the RAM in. Let's try to figure this out without breaking it. So let's power this up making the same beepy beep noises. I'm gonna plug a video card into this thing. I'll use a different one, so hopefully uh, we'll be able to see it a little better. It's a 16-bit card, as opposed to this 8-bit card here. Same error, so I must have put the RAM into the wrong bank. Great, now I gotta unplug or take the RAM out with those very fragile sockets. Now, what might be happening as well is the RAM I'm putting in here is non-parity RAM. Maybe this motherboard requires parity memory. These are one meg modules, so there shouldn't be too much memory or anything like that. But yeah, parity RAM may be required. I'm sure I have some parity one meg modules around. I just gotta look through my stash. Okay, Let's see if that made a difference. It did, did indeed. Let's go over to the uh, VGA card here. There it is. It's also cut off a little bit. Oh, you know, I just realized I probably have this in the wrong mode. You know, I forget about that. Profile load. Let's see if that changes it at all. Maybe? Oh yeah, better. Not chopped off anymore, cool. Alrighty, well this thing seems to work as well. So I'm gonna plug the keyboard in. It's exciting because these three six boards are kind of rare. The battery damage situation is, is bad on these where very often they get damaged from, from battery leakage. Uh, this is the one that doesn't even have a battery, like it uses external battery only. So that is not an issue. Is this posting? Yes, it is posting. Let's go into the BIOS, by the way. Delete, do go to BIOS, come on. Um, yeah, this one doesn't even have a battery to leak, but the other one did and it wasn't damaged because I have had many full-size 386 motherboards, not, not a whole ton, but I've had some that had so much severe damage that they were not fixable. And the fact that these are multi-layer boards and there's no schematics or anything like that just makes it next to impossible to fix these. Here we go, let's check out the CMOS setup. Now, this thing didn't have any extended settings. You notice that, so that other one that had the much more complicated chipset had all those cool features. This one, which has no extended chipset, just has the one Chips and Tech chip and a bunch of PALs, has no fancy features whatsoever. Let's just quickly take a look in that diagnostics that we saw in there. There it is. Let's see what this is all about. So the, the extra space in the ROM on this one is used for the diagnostics. And on the other one, um, so all I can do is do these three because there's no hard disk and no floppy drive. So keyboard scan code test, video test, kind of boring. Let's just do color test here. Yeah, I wish the Elgato capture device didn't 
struggle so much with that. Blue, green, cyan, red, magenta, brown. It works. This video card works. I knew that already. That's pretty much it. So let's reboot. And let's see how fast this is. This should be running at 66 megahertz. Well, it's 33. 66 divided by 2. Hopefully the XT IDE card is working. Yes, it is. Don't know why it stopped working. I'm holding down shift so it doesn't run anything. So we can go to speed 600. All right, all right, let's see how this works. You know, I used to use this landmark speed test all the time when I worked in a computer store in high school. And you see the date there, 1993. I had a job in 1991 in a computer store. I sort of like worked through those. Oh yeah, look at that, 54 megahertz. This thing is pretty good. You know, let's see about cache memory. Pretty sure I have cache check on here. Let's see, cache check. Let's see what we get for cache check. So yeah, I used to work at a computer store and that was a, a program that we absolutely used all the time for just checking that the turbo functionality was working and um, you know see how fast the computers were and stuff like that. I'm gonna say this has cache memory, yes, because you can see it goes up to 64 at 50 nanoseconds, then at 128, it goes to 75. And sure enough, it says we have 64 kilobytes of cache. That is awesome. It seems that the cache allows that part of memory, so from zero to 64K to be read at 150% of the normal speed. Well, normal speed is just 100%, to get a nice little speed boost there. And you can see right there that the main memory effectively is running at 71 nanoseconds per byte. So you think of the access time, like 80 nanoseconds or 60 nanoseconds, it's actually running the RAM at 71, so it's pretty fast. I don't even know what those modules are. I stuck in there. They are 80 nanoseconds, so they're actually being overclocked a little bit. But with the cache RAM, you're getting 47 nanoseconds per byte, so you're getting a big speed boost. Now remember, this motherboard has this memory here, and it also has this memory here. I still don't know exactly what the difference is between that and that, but whatever, it's working, whatever the difference is, it actually functions. So if we run check it here, we can check out the performance. Again, ignore the font problem there. Let's see the main benchmarks. Let's see how fast this is compared to an original XT. So 33 megahertz. I assume there's a jumper switch on here that must be just pre-installed. So there it is, 25 times faster than an XT at normal calculations. What an amazing improvement. Say you bought an XT in 1983, and then you bought a machine that had this motherboard in it in 1989, which is when these chips are from, and it was 25 times faster. Like the performance increase we get these days when we go from one processor to another, it's so small, but basically six years, or even if you go from 81 to when this motherboard came out, in eight years, the computer got 25 times faster. <laughs> like that's just, it's hard for me to fathom that because just modern stuff, like barely, the, the speed improvement is barely anything. We're only getting speed improvements, you know, in the benchmarks from multi-core. But when you look at the speed of one core from today's processors versus one from eight years ago, I don't even know if it's twice as fast. I don't think it is, but it, you know, maybe it is twice as fast, but certainly not 25 times faster like this computer is. And if you put a math coprocessor in here compared to this, the math speed on the XT, I mean, psh, just, absolute blown out of the water. And this performance improvement kept going because when you went to the 46, the 46 was so much faster than the 386 because of the cache, the more cache memory and the faster clock speeds. But once you went to the Pentium, which wasn't that many years later, you went to like a Pentium 200 MMX. I mean, it's just like, I think it's gotta be like a hundred and something times faster than the XT in just those short number of years. Absolutely staggering. So both these 360X motherboards work, which is really exciting. I have to figure out where I want to put those now. These full-size boards don't fit in all cases, but like the IBM PC5170 there obviously will take these because it was the 286 motherboards the same size as these. Now it would be a good upgrade path. And I think that's something that a lot of people did is they upgraded their 5170 to one of these motherboards, but I wouldn't want to change that machine because I like it being original. So I might have to figure out if I have a case that can take one of these, like a little tower case or something, and have a 3D6 set up. Because I actually, I don't have a 3D6 set up. I, have, um, I, have, I think I have a 46 
like that I use normally, and I also have a Pentium machine, but no 386s. That's like a one spot where the stuff I have in my KVM here, I don't have. Now as for the other motherboards, we got the PCXT clone, and this thing clearly has issues. Some more diagnostics will need to be done. I'll have to do that in another video. Maybe the BIOS uh, is bad and you just switch that out. You know, maybe there's bad RAM or maybe some other component is bad on this. So there's just a whole lot of uh, testing that will need to be done on this thing. And then finally, we have this, the IBM PC5150 motherboard. And this thing is just dead. It doesn't even start. It doesn't have a bad cap, so that's nice. But it makes that buzzing sound and is generally unhappy. Could be bad BIOS, could be bad RAM. Of course, Bank Zero is soldered right here. PCs will not post at all unless you have working uh, primary RAM here in Bank Zero. This other RAM you can just remove. So there's all sorts of possibilities that could be the problem with this. So that will make an interesting future repair video. So I think this video has been pretty long, but I hope you liked it. If you like this kind of PC exploration testing kind of thing, let me know in the comment section below. Thumbs up would be greatly appreciated. And um, yeah, I think that's going to be it. Uh, thanks for watching. Thumbs up. Patreons there. Thank you. Names scrolling. All those things. YouTube subscribe. Yeah, got the usual stuff. So stay healthy, stay safe. I'll see you next time. Bye.